två. Då ska vi se om allting fungerar. Vad du gjorde? Uh, welcome to this uh, second uh, lecture in 2 db 604. Uh, I have a couple of guys in the room. Um, I will uh, see if I can um, put the chat somewhere where I can see it. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Today we will uh, spend some time on trying to understand and figure out how to to uh, do some practical stuff. Um, so um, in this uh, first uh, uh, theme, uh, we'll say a lot of things about the the foundations, and uh, in the uh, assignment, uh, you get some some so a practical assignment. Uh, where you're asked to do some some first level decomposition. So so the uh, what we aim for today is is uh, to say a few words about uh, incremental and iterative, uh, how to and not to, and and uh, hopefully their uh, learning outcomes uh, for today uh, is that you should have a better understanding of of uh, uh, first level. Uh, decompositions and uh, trying to figure out what it is and, and uh, when to, to, to use it and, and also of course how to use it. So uh, just a short recap what we talked about last week. Uh, we more or less uh, went through the whole uh, software design or software architecture design uh activity starting with uh, stakeholders and their concerns uh, well figuring out the requirements uh, for these concerns uh, and then how to use uh, uh, well knowledge and and uh, patterns and tactics for for how to uh, for uh, well deriving options and then based on these options make decisions about an architectural strategy and uh, what we will try to do here is 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 to start with with uh, uh, well just a short recap and try to put it into an iterative and incremental setting the uh, the fact that software architecture is a decision activity should be pretty clear by now, given what we talked about last week. Uh, what you see here is, is that, well, if we, if we try to put this in an agile development context or whatever development context we may choose, we have some kind of some sort of set of requirements uh, put somewhere, possibly as user stories in the backlog, like here. But in these user stories, uh, you will find requirements that require architectural decisions and other requirements that require more regular traditional design decisions. And uh, on top of everything, uh, we have been told since, since uh, more or less day one in our software uh engineering classes that that well don't use the waterfall uh try to avoid the big uh design up front uh, work iteratively and incrementally so so the question here is then how can we starting with a backlog possibly full of user stories figuring out what are the architectural decisions and how should we work with these or towards these decisions in, it, in an iterative and incremental fashion? This is the big uh, challenge. Uh, hmm. is, is it better now? Okay, sorry for that. It was a little bit 
uh, you have to adjust it depending upon what you wear. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just oh, started again already. Yeah, welcome. No, a waterfall process. So, the question was about waterfall process is the process model where you start with uh, collecting and specifying requirements. Then you move on and you do some design, and then you move on and do the implementation, and then you do the testing, and then you're done. So the idea with waterfall is that you complete every step, which is different compared to, to iterative and incrementally, where you, where you do uh, repetitions. Yeah. So I, I was tell you a lot about a lot more about this because. Um, this is the setting here. Oh, sorry, it was blurry. I, I blew it up this one to 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 fit, match the, the screen size. But this is more or less uh, the idea of an uh, of an uh, agile process where you have your backlog uh, to the left, and uh, you uh, so the the whoops. Um, see if I can. Uh, Get the right things going here. Uh, yeah. So here, if you can see it here to the left, you have uh, your backlog uh, with user stories or whatever. And then you prepare for a sprint. And in the, uh, the sprint preparation, you uh, select carefully your user stories that you intend to, to, to work on during the sprint. And then in the sprint, well, you you go through these activities that you you uh, find everywhere. So so you analyze the story, you uh, do some design work, you implement something, and then you test it, and then you repeat that until you are so to say done. And the delivery is a little increment. So so what you see here is that you have. Uh, increments on on the left hand side, which means that you 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 pick uh, chunks of work to do increments, and then you do the work iteratively, and then well the result is a product increment. So so this is an idea where iterative comes from and what we mean by incremental. Uh, do it like this then. Um, so what about software architecture in this one? Uh, we talked about software architecture being the the uh, decisions that were sort of say relevant to large portions of the application uh, and they, so to say, had to be decided prior to, to other, well, non-architectural decisions. So the big challenge here is, is to, to uh, uh, in this uh, backlog here, try to identify when you select your stories, are there any needs for architectural decisions in order to, to uh, develop this product increment in a sprint. So should we have some architecture work as part of the sprint? So this is the, the challenge. We, we, we must so, somehow uh, get a grip on this and, and, and uh, figure out how to do this. Uh, but just quickly, repeating what, what iterative development is all about. Well, it is about avoiding the big design upfront in this setting. So, so we don't want to design everything and then move on to implementation. Because why don't we want to do that? Any idea? 
Uh, question, why don't, would we like to avoid this big design up front? Why? It's too complex to get right. Here, here's one answer on the, yeah. Yeah. So, so we have a have a couple couple of really good ones here. Uh, uh, we have uh, complexity. Well, it's difficult to 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 understand everything at this at the very start. Uh, so uh there are if, if you're really interested there are, there is something called wick, wicked problems wicked problems it's actually a problem uh that changes a bit the more you understand the problem uh, so so complexity definitely um uh, change is another one here uh you know, we, we work with customers, uh, but also the fact that we make assumptions and then later in the process, we, we understand better. Uh, that triggers change. Uh, we have the whole idea of connected to, to requirements that can go wrong there. And, and it's also about, well, making a design uh, without actually, so to say, being able to, to uh, thoroughly test it. If the assumptions, if the idea, we general idea we had is working, well, that is one great risky endeavor. So uh, what we're looking for here is really with this incremental, And in this case, iterative development is with iterative, instead of trying to do one big at once, we do little in each iteration and add and refine, improve, perfect in each and every iteration. So we make Small changes, small refinements, the more we understand of uh, the problem we have at hand. Another uh, part here is, uh, and they are closely relate related, that's why I'm, sometimes I mix them up, but uh, incremental development. Well, the idea of having uh, increments, that's, that's also, well, attractive because then you don't have to include everything in your iteration. You can actually add complexity. You can add requirements. You can add things when you have completed others. So you have something to build upon and then you add things and you integrate them. So pieces in the puzzle is of course challenging because you need to identify the pieces. And then you have to figure out where the pieces should be. And then you have to make sure that they actually fit. So uh, what is the real difference then between iterative and incremental? Well, there is a, a well, famous or famous example that is widely used with the, the Mona Lisa painting here. So the one idea could be that incremental is actually you, you, uh, you draw parts of the painting. So you, you draw it in increments. So you, you finish one increment before you complete or start with the, the next one. This is of course a simplification to prove a point, but, but uh, compared to, to uh, uh, an iterative plan, where you have more of a sketch you add 
and then you add detail, you, you refine, you improve, you perfect in the subsequent iterations. But imagine now in, in Agile, where you ac actually mix these. You, you, the idea here then should be that, well, take this sketch here, this part here, and put it up here. And then the next delivery would be this part here, up here. That's, that's like how, how you combine incremental and iterative. You iteratively refine your increments until they are, so to say, have, have achieved what you set out to achieve. And then you add more increments and you iteratively refine and improve them. So, okay, that was it for the, the cultural package today. Uh, now we come back to, 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 to software architecture design and, and agility. So, as I said in the, the, at the start of the, the lecture today, how do we do this rather waterfall-like process with, for each stakeholder, identify the concerns, specify requirements for the, the each concern, uh, pick an architectural uh, significant requirement, uh, use the, the, your knowledge uh, uh, to, to identify options, evaluate the options, make decisions, come up with a strategy documented in views. It's like waterfall. However, if we have this, this <laughs> agile uh, process in the background, we need somehow to find the shoehorn that we can use to like force it into this iterative and incremental appro approach. And the big question is, of course, how to do that. Um, So what do we have? Well, I mentioned last week in, uh, that, that, well, the architectural decisions are the important ones that, that, that uh, impact large chunks of the system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so the challenge here is, is, is really to, to find concerns, and architecturally significant requirements in the user stories. And the concept that is described here is an architectural runway. So architectural runway consists of the existing code components and technical infrastructure needed to implement near-term features, features that are, so to say, described with the user stories without excessive redesign and delay. So it's more or less like uh, you have to prepare for the feature realization. You have to prepare your architecture so that it's ready, so that the feature user stories can be developed without too much hassle and without too much redesign of the underlying architecture. So what you do then is of course that, okay, uh, when you uh, do your sprint planning, you uh, look at your stories, you pick out the stories you, can deliver as a team in the next sprint in a, or within a, in a sprint. And then you have to analyze them for, for, well, something concerns and architectural significant requirements. Are there something in there that depends upon 
an architectural significant requirement that is not yet realized in your architecture. If that is true, well, then you have to do something. You have to go through the design architectural design process, but you also need to implement it because the runway here is about code, structures, functionality. So that the architecture is prepared and you can move on and implement the feature described in the user story. So you have to transform your concerns, significant requirements into something called an architectural increment. Okay. Select stories from the backlog, backlog, assess your current runway, because remember this is iterative. So we will do this many times. So, so besides the first time, we will have something. <laughs> it's like if you build a house, the, you don't start from scratch each time. You, you lay a foundation and then you do the framing and then you do, well, you have something. So you have to assess the runway. You have your backlog. Okay, in the backlog, you have your stories. And in the stories, well, ask the question. Do we have a runway suitable for the features in these stories? If there is something missing, okay. Then you take the strategies. You might have some strategies already, or you have to come up with a new strategy to meet that concern, that set of architectural significant requirements. You design it, and that's your architectural increment. Now, there is another step, architectural design followed by a realization. You actually transform this increment, the new or revised strategies into code so that the uh, runway is ready for the feature stories. Yeah, we have a question in the room here, yeah. 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 It it could be it could be a software requirement specification if if you use a more traditional software development process. But but most uh, agile uh, processes they have an idea of of using user stories that uh, is it's not a set of imperatives like traditional software requirements where you say the system shall, the system must, the system should do this, behave like that. A user story describes some, some it's more of a soft description that is more in open for interpretation. So you can say that uh, the system should provide this because it is some value to some end user, whatever. So it's, it's more of a use case like notation, uh, less, less, uh, but it's, it, it has a structure that, that, that uh, if you follow the structure, it becomes more of a, you can actually use it also to, to, to uh, develop your test cases and so on. Uh, so, so but, but the problem here is with the story that focuses on end user value most often, well, from end user value, uh, figure out if there is something that needs to be done to the architectural runway. That is kind of a challenging uh, uh, task. So select stories from the backlog, assess them, figure out if there is a gap, fill that gap with architectural decisions, implement, uh, the strategies so you have a, a, a runway that is ready and prepared for your features. So, uh, that is one way to do it, but, but 
if you look at a, uh, a regular sprint, uh, where you actually pick from the backlog, select a couple of stories from the backlog, uh, you might as well have a separate iteration or a number of iterations running in. Uh, you have the feature iterations running on, 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 on the big circle here. And then you have, in this case, you have an architectural uh, spike. So, so you do some analysis up here, and then you figure out, okay, here we do some architecture work, we realize it, and then we can move on with the sprint and come up with the feature implementations here and then deliver something done here at this end. And this goes on and on and on and on. So early in the project, this is more frequent. Uh, later in the project, less frequent. If it's more frequent at the end of the project, you're, uh, well, you're in trouble. But, but some people will think of it like this. You have, well, you're trying to, to stay ahead of the chains, you see? So you lay out the tracks before the train arrives. So, so and this is the idea with this, this uh, 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 architectural increments uh, where you figure out what is needed just before the train arrives. So, so the question was if, if we need to adopt, if there is a change, uh, yes, because then the runway is not prepared. So, so if your assessment shows that, okay, this decision that we made two weeks ago was not perfect. So then we have to trace back and redo. But the idea here is that, well, two weeks back, that's fine compared to if it was 15 weeks back. So, so the, the earlier you discover these, the better. But, but, but again, you should, you, you should really strive for, for, so to say, have the best runway possible. So now we have an idea for how to, how to put these uh, different steps uh, into an agile process. And uh, a little bit more in detail, well, you have your assessment, you have your ASRs. Here you have uh, uh, a, uh, the ASR and your uh, current strategy. And then you make, well, uh, additions, refinements to the strategy using the options and decisions from your knowledge base. And, and then, well, you come up with a strategy increment that is uh, fed to the implementers and, and, and realized uh, as the architecture runway. Do we have any questions online? We can take 15 seconds here now, so you can, you can, you can type a question if you have. I know it takes some time to, to... yeah, we have a question in the room in the meantime. Yeah. So, so the, we come to that, but the question was about, well, the first decisions are uh, in the assignment, yes, because this is a software architecture course, so, so, so we focus on that. But, but I, will, I, will, I will try to, to show you, because this is, this is a little bit difficult, because I have to teach you how to think, <laughs> and, 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 and that is not easy, because uh, uh, there is a learning curve, and, and then when, when you realize how it should be done, well, then it's so obvious. But, but uh, 
it doesn't look like we have a question online. So, so, but the, the, what's, what's currently the big problem here is, is, is to figure out in these stories what, where the architecture uh, challenges lies. That, that, that's the big deal. And I, I understand if you, if you read this uh, nice little uh, problem description for the first assignment, this is actually written on purpose, uh, a little bit wordy, adding a lot of details, because we want to challenge you a bit to, to sort of say, look away from the details and try to find the architecture challenges in there. Because if, if there is, well, be able to set a color green or red, well, that's a feature, that's not architecture. So that's, that's the challenge. We, but we can take questions on the assignment at the end of the lecture today. So as you see here in this, well, we have the, a current selection of architecture significant requirements and the current strategy. It's iterative and it's incremental. It means that we have something and this something must be taken into account when we add, well, new decisions to the strategy or revise existing uh, decisions. So that's why we have the current strategy here. And then there is this increment down here, which is actually, in this case, slightly bigger than that one. So just to show you the idea that a different way to, to, to look, look at it uh, is, is, well, decomposition and integration. In the recorded lecture, we talk a lot about integrity. So system integrity, design integrity, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, it's actually like, well, uh, you, you, uh, if you have a, 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 well, a group of, uh, eight five-year-olds and you give them uh, uh, buckets with paint and you ask them to paint a house, uh, the chance of integrity that you actually get the house painted in the same color is fairly low. So, so what integrity means is that if you make one decision and you make one decision that there is some dependency between these two decisions. Well, you have to take this dependency into, into account. We can't, can't have a, a situation where you want to go to, uh, to uh, London on vacation and you want to go to Paris if you, the idea is that you two should go on vacation together. You have to, so to say, figure it out. And, and this is what integrity means. And it's part of the integration an integration means that you take what you have, in this case, the previous increment, and you add to it, you refine it. And in the picture here, well, the first time when you don't have anything, that's the first level, the first step, the first set of decisions. And A decomposition is that you divide something up into parts. And this is, this is important because, in fact, all the architectural decisions are complex in a sense that you can always divide them up into parts at the first level. So if you have a architectural significant requirement, it can be a structure that is required. And a structure, well, of course you could have one little component in that structure, but then it's probably not an architectural decision. But 
still the idea here of, of, of taking your uh, ASRs here, and based on, on, on the ASRs, you decompose, you identify the parts and try to figure out a strategy that, so to say, takes care of whatever is written in the ASRs. That is your first level. And, and the first level is, is important. It's important not to do too much because if you try to do too much, then you're back at this big design upfront problem or waterfall process. You try to do too much. You try to chew a big, a too big chunk of, 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 of uh, uh, food. So, so you have to be careful with the, well, how, how, how much or how big chunks you, you, you try to chew. And, and it means but that, okay, no problem. Well, we take this, we chew this, we come up with a, a, a strategy here, and then, well, we come back to it. We can do this iteratively, remember? So we come back to it, we feed the current strategy into here, we add possibly another ASR or two, and then we refine and we integrate with the previous one. It grows a bit. And then we're on back to the third and the fourth and the fifth, et cetera, et cetera. So now we have a, a question here in the, in the chat. So, and I, I'll read it now. So we just try to find the relevant requirements and make the best decisions we can with our very limited architecture knowledge at this point to create the decomposition. Exactly. This is exactly, well, because architecture is sort of a, an exploration into a problem area. You, and the first, uh, in the first assignment, it's about structuring a software system. And given the prerequisites for the course, you have some experience from that, from previous courses. So that's why we start there, to try to come up with a decomposition where you take a system and decompose it into subsystems. So we don't ask you to, to do uh, software security decomposition or performance or something like that at this point. Uh, but we will soon be a little bit more practical also here in this, in this, uh, this lecture. I decided to move on without a break, by the way. I will not uh, continue until five o'clock anyway. So, so this is a little bit the same as, as we had uh, uh, in the question in the chat here. Where should we start? Where should we start to lay our runway? And now I will say something that uh, students love. It depends. <laughs> so there is no straight answer. <laughs> So, so it depends, but I will, I, will, I will try to show you at least where you should start looking. Uh, but we can actually take out, well, design decisions, throw them out. They are not here. Architectural decisions, of course, but which concern should we start with? Should we start with performance? Should we start with security? Uh, maybe if that is very, very, very important. If you're uh, asked to, to uh, uh, come up with a design for a uh, image processing system. So uh, real-time image processing. Hmm, performance is important there. So maybe you have to consider performance from the very start. It's not an add-on that can come late in the project. It has to be there from, from, from the very start. Whereas security might be shifted down in, in the priority list. Uh, persistency, uh, the ability to, to, to store information in between executions. Well, that might also be, well, found not at the top of the priority list. 
Uh, but modularity, hmm, what is modularity? But yeah, modularity is, is actually the, the basic, one of the basic mechanisms we use, that we humans use to, to uh, master complexity. We don't, we don't see everything. We see parts and then we connect things. Uh, when we uh, solve problems, divide and conquer. So you divide it up into sub problems and then you solve, you conquer each and every sub problem and then you put them back together. Okay, just look up uh, the recipes in a cookbook. It doesn't say recipe meatballs done. It says recipe meatballs, ingredients, bah, 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 bah. and then how to do it. So it is divided up and then each part is described or solved. And then when you put it back together, you do it in the right, right order possibly, well then, you're done. So it's the same thing what we're doing here. If we start with modularity, we can start to divide the uh, decisions for, for performance up and assign it to modules as responsibilities. We can do the same for security. We can do the same for persistency. And we can do the same for functionality. And this is, if you, Remember your, your classes in object-oriented design and object-oriented programming. The teacher may have asked you to, to, well, design some classes for this problem and then blah, 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 blah. That was a first level decomposition you did there because you turned that problem, problem description into a decomposition of subsystems classes that correspond, well, at runtime, you instantiate objects, and these objects work together to solve the problem. But you didn't do it in one iteration, in one single increment. You probably started with one class, added some methods, added some attributes in your first iteration, your first increment. Then, okay, now we add this class, we connect the two, add some attributes, methods in that. Now we have a second increment or a second decomposition. So uh, which concern you should start with depends on the problem, but I would say that thinking in modules is always a good thing because that helps you to divide and conquer any problem. So in order to, to uh, have an example here, I decided to, to uh, uh, add, well, DevOps to, uh, to uh, this, this agile idea of architecting. Uh, so what about architecture in this agile DevOps setting? Well, DevOps is where you have one development process, which pretty much is, is what you're used to. And then you have, you release your software, you deploy it, so it's up and running. You operate it and then you monitor it and then you feedback to the development. So you have like a continuous process here where you have an opportunity to improve your software system continuously. Uh, and then you release new uh, versions, deploy them, and they operate, go live uh, 
so that end users may use them. Uh, there are two. This is this is on the on the on the on this side on the dev side. What you have is is typically you have a a, a pipeline of of software development tools that pretty much automate the process of, of testing, compiling, uh, packaging, and, and uh, well, the build here, and then up to the uh, release and the deploy. So, so these pipelines are critical uh, for the success here. Uh, but then you have not just continuous integration and continuous deployment here, uh, because then you have online monitoring uh, and this monitoring feeds back into the planning. So, so you may use this for 50, 50 test A and B testing, for instance, so you can, you can check whether users like this uh, workflow better than another workflow. And, and you can feed that back into your development plan. So next release will only contain the more or the better liked workflow, et cetera. So you can do a lot of things that are very interesting here, but uh, this is a, a, a development process. But what's interesting here is, is that this development process might be the first architectural concern that you have to deal with in this project. And I show you why. Here's a lot of text. You can read it uh, uh, offline, but, but it's more or less in short three parts. Here's a problem. There will always be errors, mistakes made in your software can be intentional uh, because uh, you thought that the customer would like this, but it turns out the customer doesn't. Uh, so uh, you have to constantly work on maintaining your, your software. You have to, to improve it, perfect it, et cetera, uh, add new functionality. And uh, well, that used to be done in, a, in an offline fashion where, uh, they uh, launched one version, it was sold to the customers, they used it, and then eight months later, uh, a new version arrived, uh, typically on some media. It was a little bit before uh, online uh, upgrades, etc. cetera. And, uh, but what we can do here is uh, if we, instead of having this, eight months, 10 months maintenance cycles, if we instead architect for continuous delivery, we can have delivery of new functionality, uh, updated functionality, perfected functionality continuously. So there are some examples, uh, some car manufacturers, for instance, so, so they have an idea of each and every time you turn your key, but you don't turn it anymore, you press a button. But every time you do that, every time you start the car, you have a new version of the software done in, in your system. So there's a new release delivered overnight. Uh, but if you want to do that, well, your system, your software must be able to, 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 to deal with that. So it's actually an architectural concern. There must be a delivery capability. You must ensure some kind of modifiability in the, in the software. Because if the software can't accept upgrades, well, it doesn't work. So in this case, continuous delivery is actually a concern that has to be dealt with at the architectural level. And uh, this is done by our adopting architectural styles. This is the knowledge thingy in the design process. Uh, for instance, microservices and serverless architectures uh, use design patterns 
of course, when we implement these, and blah, 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 blah. So something that is partly part of the development process actually sets the requirements for, for the architecture for the system. So what could be the concerns for your first iteration then? Well, in this uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment, well, it could definitely be that to, to uh, set up that environment, to establish a skeleton application, a skeleton system that you can use to demonstrate that your pipelines are working and you can, uh, well, have some application up and running. That could be your first iteration because you have answered a couple of architectural requirements with that. You don't have to add more details than that. It's up and running, it works. So, but it can also be a system architecture because if we think big, really big, it could be that we have a server side with systems that connects to other external systems. There is a lot of storage. And then we have clients running on Android, iOS. We have clients running on uh, Mac OS. We have clients running on Windows. We have maybe a, a web uh, application. Well, suddenly we, it's not just system. It's like a system of systems. So, so that could be another first decomposition where you show which systems you have, platforms they're running on, uh, possibly if there is some special hardware, how it's deployed, how they communicate. That's another way of, of taking the first step towards sort of say conquering the system. And the third one is, is, let's focus on the software. Pick one of the systems. Pick the service side of this system. What software is running on, 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 on this, this server? What is the decomposition? Which components does this software contain? What APIs are these components publishing? open for others, other components to use, internally or externally. Are there inner structures, subsystems of subsystem, inside subsystems? That's another one. But remember, if this is the first iteration, the first level, maybe you should stop at the first level. Next iteration, pick one of the subsystems and look inside. What do we have on the inside? Are there additional subsystems in there? Or can we possibly find classes or whatever in order to implement the functionality, the capabilities we're looking for in this component? So the first level can be used to, to uh, it's, not, it's not do this. It's actually the first step you take in whatever concern you're addressing is the first level. So in the assignment, it's about this one here and maybe this one too. Sorry? Yeah. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a first, it's like the first iteration, the first increment, and then you do a second and then you do a third. Adding details in each. So in principle, you could have like the first, you will not get an E if you do this on the assignment, but, but you could have like the first level could be the, this is the system, a box, the system. We ask for a little bit more than that. 
Uh, so just to, to show you a little bit about uh, this, this uh, decision to go with uh, uh, DevOps and, and continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, Amazon Web Services, you've probably heard about it. If not, you've probably seen the logo because it's more or less everywhere. Uh, so this is one of the options, one of the decision alternatives you have in this architectural design process. Should we go for, for this or should we go, go for Microsoft uh, Usher or should we go for Google? Come on. These are the big guys. These are the alternatives. And what's interesting here is, is, is really that, that if you say, okay, let's go for AWS, what does that mean? One little decision, what does it mean? Okay, now, okay, we have a question. Sorry, we couldn't understand what you mean with you need to use this one and this one. Uh, was it about, uh -huh. okay, I think I, I think I got, I think I understand what you mean by your question. Uh, so in the assignment, we ask for, for a couple of, of first levels. We ask for a system architecture or a physical architecture, and we ask for software system architecture. That is what I mean by you need to use this one and that one. I'm sorry, sometimes I get carried away and start to, to pointing at the, the uh, projector screen here in the room, and I understand that you guys can't see that. Sorry. Uh, okay, that was clarification. So, so uh, back to this. What does it mean? Well, what's interesting here is that, okay, this decision, it's a rather big one. We go for Amazon. Yeah. But suddenly you have a couple of new architecturally significant requirements that comes from that decision. So you decided to use this? Well, now you have to do this. You have to uh, come from monoliths. So like big one system, everything put together into microservices. You have to decompose whatever you have, if you have something, or you have to apply these, these rules in whatever you intend to build, microservices. So you have to do a microservice-based decomposition and whatever that means. So this is some kind of modularity architectural significant requirement. It uh, is a requirement on how you mod the modules you create uh, for your system. I will show you more about this in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, the uh, code pipeline from AWS also uh, uh, prescribes that you should have something called polyglot persistence which is uh, the fact that you actually use different uh, uh, persistency uh, techniques for different uh, applications in your uh, or for different parts of your application. Uh, this is one of the more uh, different ones. And then, oh yeah, in the, in the middle there, of course, you also have to, to uh, uh, use uh, AWS uh, serverless services. So uh, AWS Lambdas actually. Um, so you have in this, by this first decision here to, to, to decide to use AWS, you have two uh, modularity uh, architectural significant requirements that comes from that, the, the monolith and the serverless uh, services. And then you have one on the persistency, the polyglot. And these will expand and grow into more. Uh, 
I would say the, so. The question in in in, in uh, online here is CICD is is just one possible focus for assignment one, correct? Uh, I would say that you should follow the instructions in the assignment, and they will not ask you to do this uh, for for continuous uh, integration uh, and deployment. They ask for uh, the the physical and and the modular uh, the subsystem decompositions. So so. Uh, Check the assignment description. I just used the uh, CICD as an example, uh, which can also be kind of interesting. Okay, great. So this one. Uh, so this is actually a picture I borrowed from my other presentation, one of the recorded ones uh, on decomposition, uh, and and and. AWS, they uh, provide four decomposition patterns uh, that you can use to decompose your application uh, into microservices. So you can use, you can, yeah, you can decompose uh, according to subdomains. So like UI, documents, reports, users, and sharing like here. But you can also do it after business capability, after transactions, and you can also do a team-based decomposition. So we have a question. Okay, so a, a microservice, uh, a serverless microservice is, is more or less like well, in object orientation, you have objects, and in that object, you find uh, you 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 can store data, the attributes, and you can uh, invoke methods on that data. Uh, but it means that you have data and methods, uh, uh, which is like a state and behavior bundled together in one. But. Uh, a serverless service here is, is actually a single function, a function as a service. So, so the, the, the decomposition, the module here is a function. So not objects, classes, or whatever. It's, a, it's a function. So, so this is what's uh, the idea that you make one decision about using AWS and it forces the architect, forces the designers, forces the programmers to do behave in a certain way to, to match the requirements set by that decision. So decomposing by subdomains, you could also do it, as I said, for instance, by business capabilities, you can, decompose, you have marketing, sales, warehouse, management, HR. And this is actually part of uh, design options, the alternatives that we have uh, in our architecture design activity. We have a uh, uh, in this case, if we decompose by, by subdomain, well, we get, uh, and now we remember that we have, we, we, it's, not, it's not components that are the, 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 the modules here. It's not objects, it's a single function, a function as a service. So, this is a very loosely coupled architecture. Um, we love loosely coupled architectures because that makes continuous integration and continuous deployment pretty much a straightforward activity. If there were tight connections, well, that would be much more challenging to do the integration because you had to consider so many different dependencies. You can also scale the system much more easily because you can add cores and you can shift 
functions to new cores, which means that you can scale up and scale down fairly easy. Okay, so that was the upside, but there's never a free lunch, which means there is also a downside here. Uh, there is a risk here that we create too many microservices. So uh, if we have a big system, service discovery is, is, is an important function here. You, you, you look up where is my service I need. And if you have a lot of services, in this case, too many, it can be challenging just to find the right service. And it can take time to figure out where the right service is. Uh, so uh, this is uh, another uh, example of where you have, in this case, four alternatives, four guiding rules that you can use when you decompose your system to match the architectural requirements set by your AWS uh, code pipeline. And what you get here is, okay, should we go for service per team pattern or should we go for transactions pattern or subdomains or business capability? Well, they told you, tell you down here for each and every one, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? And you as an architect, you know that hmm, scalability is quite important for us. So maybe this is a good one. There is no, almost no risk that we will end up with too many microservices because it's not a fairly big application in terms of functionality. So scalability, hmm, that's super important. So, and the risk is low for this disadvantage. Oh, let's go for this one. So, uh, There's a question if we can decompose by business first and then continue decomposing by subdomain. I would say, I would say yes, <laughs> but if I say yes, I will just mess with your uh, minds. But but it is it is possible. You you can do you can mix paradigms. Uh, you can mix patterns. Uh, it will make it a bit more challenging. But but remember that that. This is the nice thing with a system. In a system, you define something uh, like a, a uh, I would go back to the, the, the picture here. Uh, uh, it's like, it's like uh, uh, if you look at the person uh, and what, the, what that individual wears, you can see the clothes, but you never know what they wear underneath. And it's the same with components here because you can see what's what's shown to the outside, but what's going on on the inside, you're not interested in. So uh, I would say, Andreas, that you can definitely do whatever you want on the inside as long as you deliver what you promised to the outside. But but if that is a good thing or not, I leave to you leave it to you to decide. Uh, so today's insights. Some observations. Uh, selecting concerns and, and architectural significant requirements is important because the order you pick them may actually have a great influence on the resulting architecture. Because if you make one decision before another, uh, it can be difficult to track back, trace back and restart can be very costly. Uh, but for instance, this, this AWS decision, it is one super big decision for you to, to well, that will impact the rest of the, uh, well, the project for, for its entire duration. Uh, it's important to establish this, this architecture runway. And as I said, it can be just, well, it works like setting up uh, the pipeline with a very small application, it works. Great, you have something to build upon, iteratively and incrementally. Integration is challenging. So the better your designs are to separate concerns, to 
uh, limit coupling uh, and so on, the more easy it is to integrate. The smaller the chunk is, the fewer the dependencies are, like with uh, the serverless microservices here. And the final, fourth and final one, your development organization is a stakeholder, not just customers, management, etc. Your development organization, if you want to work with continuous develop, uh, integration and, and deployment, DevOps, well, as a stakeholder, you get a concern, architectural significant requirements that you have to address as an architect. So what is a first level decomposition? Well, it is the first iteration and in increment to outline a strategy. And the strategy, what it is, it depends on the concern you're addressing. If it's uh, a system architecture, well, the goal here is to, to uh, um, figure out uh, which hardware is in the system, which systems or software systems is, is running on the different hardware, et cetera, et cetera. That leads to, to one decomposition, one strategy. But if it's a software architecture for one of the systems in that, well, that will possibly lead to a, a, a component or module D, uh, subsystem, sorry, module uh, component and subsystems are pretty much interchangeable. Um, so so a, a component decomposition or a subsystem decomposition. Uh, when should you use it? Well, it's the first for each strategy. So, so you use it every time. Uh, start small, don't make, uh, try to, to, to chew too much. Make it small, refine it stepwise in a second, in a third, et cetera, uh, level, and try to grow with control so that you don't go too far. Because remember that you have to integrate, not just with uh, that concern. You have to integrate with all other concerns as well. So um, that was a bit about it for today and and uh, i give you a couple of seconds to 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 formulate your questions here now Okay, so no questions in the room. Okay, <clears throat> now we have one question. Uh, if the fur, if the, uh, if whatever you do in assignment one uh, should be used or will be used in 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 other, uh, I would say uh, yes. So Lawrence, the question you asked, well, the answer to your question, Lawrence, is yes. Uh, Nitin, uh, ooh, does decomposition involve only system components? Does it also consider stakeholders and their views? No, a decomposition is uh, focusing on the system, uh, but, but it represents something that you can show a stakeholder or a group of different, several different stakeholders that are interested in understanding uh, that aspect of the system, or I should say that view. Uh, Christopher, for a first level, it comes to do we need to include the stakeholder, the view? Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, motivate, always motivate why, uh, but you don't have to, to motivate why you use a certain type of diagram in this, I think, no. Ooh, would you mind to briefly explain about microservices? Others might know about it already. Uh, it's not important, I should say. It's just an example. Uh, a microservice is is uh, something that you can you can actually uh, there is uh, some 
well, don't use the book. Uh, it's better if you, you look it up yourself. Um, I don't have anything prepared, but no. It's, it's not important for, for this, this, uh, this course because it's a, it's a, uh, what's important here is really that you, you, there are different ways to, to structure a system. That's, uh, does the physical decomposition just include the hardware architecture? As I said, uh, in the first level, it might be that you just outline whatever hardware you have, uh, but then you can also add uh, what physical software systems, uh, operating systems, uh, other systems that that runs. So a physical installation of some piece of software can also be be something that is part of a, a, a physical decomposition. So, for instance, your uh, you have a cell phone, and on that cell phone you run Android, blah blah blah, and and something like that because that, that physical decomposition can be used to, for instance, communicate to, to your testing organization how they should set up their, their uh, test beds for, for running tests. Okay. So I think we're running out of questions here now. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to, to put them online. Uh, I will explain the difference between views and viewpoints uh, in the next theme. So I will not do it now, Nitin. You have to, you have to wait. Yeah. Okay, we have a question in the room. A conceptual, conceptual is something that you use to, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't have to, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a model that uses concepts as opposed to a physical decomposition that uses physical entities like a phone, a computer, etc. So a class model, for instance, a class model is a conceptual model. A class is a concept. Sorry? Yeah, you, you use classes to uh, show conceptually what is needed in order to implement the requirements, the functionality a system should deliver. Yeah. Oh. If you watch the lectures, uh, there is also a, a study guide with reading instructions. Uh, so so uh, I think if you watch the lectures, uh, you get a fairly nice introduction, but then you can always uh, read up on the, the chapters. And there is also a set of uh, study questions that you can, you can prepare uh, answers to as, as a way of, of, of uh, studying. Yeah. And then we have, of course, the... the Tutoring, uh, Friday, for me, it's Friday at least. I'm not sure if you, uh, Francis or Nadim has schedule, schedule any other slots. I, I prefer that you have questions, otherwise it will, it, well, the question was about if you, it's okay to go to a tutoring session if you don't have any questions. Uh, but I would say, if you don't have any questions, you have a lot of questions. Because, the, well, if you, if you, then you have a lot of questions to ask if you, if you don't have one. But, but, but uh, come prepared, it's much more fun for you and it's definitely much more fun for me because, well, otherwise I have to come up with what to say. <laughs> uh, can we attend this class in campus as well? Yeah, I have, we're a nice little group of, of uh, five students and me in the room here, so you're definitely welcome. Uh, it's always more fun to, uh, but you know, of course we should, so, so to say, uh, keep distance and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, you're welcome uh, anytime uh, here. Uh, so um, next week, uh, D 1173, same time, same room, I guess. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I stopped the recording.